So today I want to talk about some other stories related to climate change. The theme of the week really has been climate change. As in the past three videos, I've covered how climate change has been affecting infrastructure and exacerbating problems that already exist, such as water main breaks and the issues of the U.S. electric grid. In addition to that, I also covered how wildfires highlight issues under capitalism in a cyclical fashion. And throughout all of these videos, there has also been an undertone of talking about water and water scarcity, as water is necessary for fixing all three of these issues, and water scarcity is a product that is going to occur from the continued climate crisis that will continue to exacerbate all of these problems. I now want to take a look at a few smaller stories to round out the week. These are stories that occurred within the past few weeks that were too small to be videos in and of themselves, but are still very much related to and quite important to the topic of climate change. For our first story, I want to start off with uh, looking at the Pacific Northwest, where high temperatures actually cooked shellfish alive. Now we have here from the Washington Post, crushing heat wave in the Pacific Northwest and Canada cooked shellfish alive by the millions. And if you look at this absolutely absurd image on the screen, you'll see a bed of mussels that has nothing but dead mussels that were killed and literally cooked in the ocean by the extremely high temperatures. This is both frightening and uh, absolutely absurd to see. Now we found out about this when a marine ecologist who lives by the sea in Vancouver found this bed of mussels that had been popped open and dead. The heat beating down on the rocks had killed them and she could see dead tissue between their shells. Meanwhile, a dead crab floated in the water. Now all of this is going to have a huge set of uh, impact on the food supply. It's going to have an effect on ecosystems, which we'll cover, and uh, it's going to have an effect on the economy. An estimated 1 billion small sea critters, including mussels, clams, and snails, died during the heat wave in the Salish Sea, off the more than 4,000 miles of linear shore, according to marine biologist Chris Harley. Record-breaking temperatures hit the Pacific Northwest at the end of June, with an all-time high in British Columbia of 121 degrees Fahrenheit. British Columbia reported at least 719 people suffered sudden and unexpected deaths, which is more than three times what one would normally expect in the province during a seven-day period. That is absolutely frustrating to hear. That means that the heat, in addition to all the damage it did to the sea critters, actually caused at least two, uh, two-thirds time, uh, more deaths than what we would normally expect, uh, with, uh, it, with it being three times the death counts, at least two-thirds of that value can indeed be counted as people who may not have died otherwise. That is a significant amount of people dying simply from the heat. But when we get back to the topic of the marine life, the heat is also affecting business. Many shellfish farms on the coastal regions were hit by historically hot temperatures. And if they lose 80% of their oysters, for example, then you're out of business for two to three years because it takes two to three years for the cycles of oysters to continue. Now, yes, that's going to have an impact on economy, but I think far more important, that's going to have an impact on the way the food supply runs. A few of these topics that I'm going to cover today do deal with food. And there's a good question that we need to have about the food supply and in terms of all of this, the ecosystem. Losing mussels and other bivalve mollusks, such as oysters and clams, can throw off the entire ecosystem. University of Washington marine biologist Emily Carrington told The Post, Shellfish perform critical ecosystem services, modifying their local environments just by their presence and aggregation. They filter a high volume of water and play a central role in the food chain, she said. And it needs to be noted that almost a billion sea creatures died from one heat dump. Now, if this were to repeat itself, if this were to continue, if we were to find that this is more common, this might have drastic impacts not only on the ecosystem, but on our food consumption, especially as we move into some of these other topics, like this one, where a bunch of fruits are actually being severely damaged from the heat wave. As a matter of fact, a fruit growers association 
in British Columbia estimates that 50 to 70 percent of cherry crops were damaged in the heat wave, as well as apples, apricots, and some other fruits. The cherries were literally cooked right in the orchard, and they had a brown color with burnt leaves and stems. It looked as if someone had taken a blowtorch to them. That is how hot it had gotten. And it's so bad that the cherries were too damaged to be even used for juices and purees. Raspberries and blueberries had actually taken a hit as well, where 75% of one area's uh, raspberry crop and between 10 and 30% of the blueberry crop were of such poor quality that they can only be used for juice. And this also moves us into a situation in Missouri where climate change is triggering rare crop diseases and things that are not usually in Missouri. New crop diseases pervading Missouri have been linked to climate change and they're directly impacting crop production. Climate change has already made Missouri a little bit more hot and a little bit more humid, but it's also caused some diseases for crops like corn and soybeans, you know, American staple foods, things that are eaten quite often that are put in pretty much everything. Um, they are the ones being affected by this uh, particular uh, set of uh, diseases. If not treated properly, farmers could see a significant loss in crop yields. There are two specific diseases that are affecting uh, these crops, including tar spot and bacterial leaf streak. Uh, tar spot is a fungal infection, and bacterial leaf streak is a bacterial infection that are much more familiar to uh, tropical climates. They are not usually in Missouri. Increases in the amount of moisture in the atmosphere caused by climate change have brought these new diseases to the state. As the temperatures rise, the air can hold more moisture, which is what we talked about in previous videos when it came to the fires and the droughts that are happening. The moisture in Missouri's case mostly comes from the Gulf of Mexico, uh, with warming oceans being able to make it so that more water vapor is in the air and thus more moisture for precipitation. And uh, one other uh, disease, the Circospora uh, leaf blight on uh, the soybean crop has become more common than in previous years. The crop disease has been a problem in the South, but is now far more common in the North Central region of the United States. And again, a lot of what we're seeing is a shift where these diseases that had previously been either from the U.S. South or from tropical climates are starting to become present in areas like Missouri. They normally haven't existed in this region, and that's going to mean a shift in how things are handled. And a lot of this is going to affect the food supply. A lot of crops that were used to growing in one region may start having to be grown in another region further north. Uh, there might be a shift in how food supplies are run, and that's going to take time to recreate infrastructure and to reestablish routes. And while that's happening, I wonder the effect that that's going to have on the food supply and people getting access to food. And that's a scary prospect. And again, this is just from one summer, right? Um, all of these events have occurred within one summer, and especially in the uh, case of the shellfish, that's something that could occur time and time again. And if more moisture starts entering into the atmosphere in places like Missouri, it might become even more common for these diseases and blights to occur. And so there's going to be some options through either genetic modifications or, again, moving the supplies up into a more uh, temperate climate further north. Other than that, I can't really think of anything that will help in this moment, but it might even also lead to an increase in new pesticides that we might need to come up with or new ways to cure plants. Uh, a lot of insects are also on the rise as well and are causing damage and are causing further droughts in certain areas, which we uh, briefly covered, I believe, in the video on the forest fires, where a lot of beetles are burrowing into trees and are essentially knocking them down. Now, another issue that is kind of tied to this type of uh, infection is that diseases and microbes that are affecting humans are actually coming in larger supplies now. In fact, a brain-eating amoeba is becoming more common due to climate change in the areas around Texas. 
As our planet warms, a tiny, tiny deadly creature is becoming more common, the brain-eating amoeba. The organisms can gain access to the brain and cause death. The amoeba is found in stagnant waters, but likes warm temperatures. You'll find it in ponds where water is stagnant, but it warms up quickly with Texas summer temperatures. So again, you're going to start seeing a lot more microbes becoming a far more common, and you're going to now see humans being affected with diseases as well that would have required lower, uh, higher temperatures. This is going to be a huge part of the shift and getting used to the new normal that we've welcomed ourselves into. And maybe we'll be able to push this off and make sure it doesn't happen more consistently, but these extreme weather instances, these shifts in microbes, is something that is a product of all of the things that we've been doing to the planet for at least the past 100 plus years. Now, uh, for the next topic, I want to go back to the Pacific Northwest very briefly, where roads literally buckled under extreme heat. Concrete is actually buckling. So there's actually two issues here. Steel drawbridges actually had to be doused with water, which of course ties us back into the issue of water scarcity, um, to make sure they didn't swell shut under the oppressive heat. Meanwhile, certain roadways buckled and literally cracked and started popping up as the expansion of the concrete slabs from the heat uh, essentially made it so that the roads, which are already an infrastructure issue in the United States, ended up getting even more damaged. And so we're starting to see a lot more of this. And the more heat waves we have, the longer heat waves last, the longer droughts occur, the higher temperatures get, we're going to see more and more of these roads expanding. So we might not might need to start thinking about using different materials or changing up how we handle roads in some time in the near future. Because this is far far too dangerous to leave unaddressed. And to wrap up today, I want to take a look at a situation in New York City, where New York City warned climate change is here as storm floods, streets, and subway. Uh, commuters having to wade through waist-deep water on subway concourses, rain cascading directly onto train platforms, desperate motorists rescued by police from their inundated cars, the battering New York City has taken from Tropical Storm Elsa has raised questions as to how well the metropolis is prepared for the ravages of the climate crisis. And on screen there is an image of a person wading through floodwaters near the 157th Street metro station in New York City. On screen now is an image of the subway station where the subway was literally filled with water at 157th Street. Videos taken by commuters show that people were struggling through murky flood water in order to catch the subway at 157th Street station. It was filthy water, completely opaque, a dark gray green with bits of rubble floating in it. It was really disgusting. Other videos captured torrents of water flowing downstairs at the 149th Street station and commuters at Spring Street tentatively moving along a platform as rainwater gushed from the ceilings. That's terrifying. That means that the infrastructure is not holding up. That water is literally seeping through the ceilings. That's going to cause more extensive damage and erosion over time. And that's things that are going to need to be paid for and repaired. But if these storms end up becoming more common due to climate crisis and climate change, then this is going to mean more funds have to go to infrastructure or we're going to have to rethink how things are done. If the drains at the street level can't handle the water, it will come into the vents into the station. Which begs the question, are the drains blocked or are they just not able to handle the capacity of water? And if they're not, can they be expanded in such a way that would allow for more water to seep in? Meanwhile, above the ground, major highways in the Bronx became completely flooded with police using a truck to rescue at least a dozen drivers who had become trapped by the uh, fast rising water. Um, basically, the, there's just been a huge issue of infrastructure in New York City. And especially scientists point out that the extreme rainstorms affecting the Northeast, including New York, are now consistent with uh, climate uh, different from all prior experience, and they're likely to become more common. 
As a matter of fact, research has estimated that New York City could be hit by these severe floods uh, that reach more than seven feet high, enough to inundate a first story of a building every five years within the next decade if the planet heating gases are not radically reduced. Such major floods were only expected to occur once every 25 years in the 1970s. So between the 1970s and now, that has dropped from 25 years down to 5 years, meaning that this is becoming even more common. And these extreme weather instances all across the board, these effects are starting to happen more commonly. And that's really what climate change is doing more than anything else. It's making things that used to be extreme, used to be once in a hundred years, once in a thousand year events, and they're making them once in 10 years once in five years, and are making them far more common. We may not get these events every year, but if they're happening every five years where a billion sea critters are dying, where crops are getting burned and scorched and cooked while they're still on the orchard, when you're having, you know, amoebas that are capable of consuming brain matter ending up in our water that we're trying to swim in, in stagnant waters, when we're seeing the roads uh, literally buckle from the heat, and when we're seeing flash flood warnings throughout New York City every five years to seven feet high covering first floor buildings, that is a scary, scary prospect. All of this is absolutely terrifying. And this is in addition to all of the other issues of infrastructure and capitalism and our current system and the way we keep handling things. And this is the direction that we keep pushing in every time we keep allowing for these fossil fuels to continue to exist when we don't go for carbon neutral options. We genuinely need to start shifting in directions of working towards limiting that our carbon output and start to think about this as an actual new normal. We've done a lot of damage to the climate already. And we're going to have us have to seriously invest in changes, not just in our climate and carbon um, emissions, but also in our infrastructure to prepare ourselves for this new normal, because otherwise things are going to get worse. We have made a lot of our infrastructure around the idea that things work a certain way and they no longer do. So we're going to have to innovate, we're going to have to create new things, and it's going to mean a lot of investment in resources and coming up and developing new tools to handle these increased amounts of storms, this increased amounts of droughts and flash flood warnings and bacterial infections, and again, the high heat from things like the heat dome that are going to affect the food supply. So... With that said, if you like this video, please give it a thumbs up, hit the subscribe button and bell for notifications. You can follow me on Twitter and check out my Discord where we have conversations about this and so many other things all the time. And we have all sorts of events that love to have you there for. That said, my name is Anarchist Terra and I thank you for watching.